this presentation and the corresponding slides are copyrighted by Robson Forensic and may not be recorded, copied, distributed, or otherwise used without authorization. On pavement defect investigations, um, we're going to be looking at this topic from the perspective of maintenance as well as construction. And we have two experts joining us today from our highway engineering practice group. Uh, we've got Thomas Leiden, who, who just turned his camera on, as well as Kevin Gorman. Thomas, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen if you want to go ahead and share yours so you can pull up your slide. And, and while you do that, I'll just take an opportunity to tell all the attendees a little bit about you, Thomas. Um, the, the reason I was so excited to have you join us today is that you're approaching this topic with, with decades of experience working for a state DOT prior to joining Robson Forensic as a, as a full-time expert. And, and you are bringing experience um, in the maintenance aspects, in the construction aspects, in, in everything in between. And before you get started on the topic of your presentation, can you tell everybody a little bit more about your background and then also uh, the types of forensic cases that you typically uh, apply your expertise to? Thank you, Jesse. As Jesse mentioned, um, I have over 35 years experience in the traffic, highway, and transportation field. Most of that time was with a State Department of Transportation. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering, a Master's in Business Administration, and I'm a Certified Project Management Professional. Currently licensed as a Professional Engineer in 15 states. I began my DOT career carrying a clipboard. In that role, I inspected highway construction projects, including temporary traffic control zones. I concluded my DOT career as the State Maintenance Engineer. In that role, I was responsible for statewide policy and maintenance standards. During my time with the DOT, I was involved in all aspects of highway engineering, including the planning, design, construction, and maintenance of those facilities. Been involved in a number of national organizations, including the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, the Transportation Research Board, and the American Society of Civil Engineers. I am a co-inventor with several DOT colleagues of a system for detecting the traffic impacts due to snow and ice events, and then calculating the effectiveness of, of our agency's response. During my time with Robson, I've had the opportunity to serve um, in, on several cases involving the proper treatment of snow and ice conditions. Before I jump into today's agenda, I'm gonna ask, uh, ask you to read the statement that I've included to the right. In my experience and in my practice, I find that motorcycle and bicycle users are often overlooked. They're overlooked from the, by the maintenance staff who tend to think of defects in terms of the impacts to cars and trucks. Both of these vehicles have larger tires, four wheels, and greater stability. When inspecting for pavement defects, maintenance staff may overlook the nuances of two-wheeled vehicles fail to appreciate uh, the smaller tires and only having two wheels in contact with the pavement and vehicles that are inherently less stable. Some of these defects may be an annoyance to cars and truck traffic, but have catastrophic consequences to motorcyclists and bicyclists. Today, I'm going to talk about six common pavement defects, what causes them, situations that can develop if they're not addressed, and what we would look for in our investigations. I'll wrap up my portion of today's presentation by talking about preventive measures that agencies can take to design, guard, or warn of these pavement defects. Wheel ruts are longitudinal depressions in the wheel path, probably best illustrated by the two photographs to your right. Heavy traffic loads and frequent loads tend to push the asphalt layer, that surface layer, to the side of the wheel path, creating depressions in the wheel trap path of those vehicles. The lower 
photograph shows water that is ponding. This can lead to hydroplaning issues or in colder climates may cause freezing or during snow and ice operations, operators are pushing that snow and slush material into the wheel path. Now for cars and trucks, they're most impacted by the hydroplaning or if they try to escape the wheel path onto higher ground, they may find themselves encroaching upon adjacent lanes of travel. For a motorcycle, they're impacted by a lane changing maneuver. Cyclists riding in the middle of one lane who drop to, in order to change lanes, drops down into one wheel path, back up onto a ridge, back into another one, and finally returning to a higher, higher ground. Uh, this can affect the handling characteristics of motorcycles. In our field investigations, we'd be alert to the profile of the roadway surface and make observations as to whether water uh, was ponding and observe the weather conditions for the date of the incident to see what was taking place at that time. At the same time, we'd identify whether the maintaining agency took appropriate temporary measures to correct the hazard, such as milling off the high spots or filling in the low spots. Now it's very likely that all of us had, have either hit a pothole or had to dodge one in our travels. Potholes are localized failures caused by board, poor drainage of the pavement surface, as well as compounded by steady and heavy vehicle loads. In cases of potholes, would be investigating the length, depth, vehicle size, and speed of the vehicle to identify whether that pothole, so to speak, was reasonably safe or possibly unsafe. For cars and trucks, the biggest threat may be to how the driver responds. Motorcyclists and bicyclists are most impacted due to strikes or trying to avoid a pothole. The photograph in the upper right shows a pothole located along the edge line. This is an area where bicyclists are trained and conditioned to ride. A cyclist approaching that pothole, if a cyclist makes a maneuver to the left to avoid it, they might find themselves, into, find themselves in the traffic stream. If they make an avoidance maneuver to the right, they're off the roadway. Our investigations would look at the agency's records, identify whether they had policies or procedures in place for the timely reporting and repair of these holes. Now potholes can be repaired in many different ways, but what's most important is that the agency um, properly compact the pothole so that they leave the treated surface area flush with the surrounding pavement surface. I was involved in a case where over a period of months and years, the maintaining agency was filling in potholes, but was not leaving them flush. So in their efforts to fill these in, they ended up creating an irregular pavement surface through what I described as a, it was a quilt-like pattern of lumpy patched potholes. Pavement drop-off is probably best illustrated by the, the diagram and the photograph to your right. Shoulders might be constructed of either soil or stone. Over time, that soil might settle or the stone is displaced due to previous runoff the road incidents. We see this scenario quite a bit in our casework. Driver moving on down the, the roadway, drift off the edge line just a bit. They abruptly realize their vehicles have dropped off the pavement. Their immediate response or their immediate action maybe is going to be to return to the roadway. They find their, their inside of their tire is scrubbing along that vertical surface and they may, in their effort to return to the roadway, overcorrect and lose control of their vehicle. They may shoot across the roadway or into oncoming traffic. If we see a, a head-on crash, which for no apparent reason, 
we may be investigating the shoulder conditions that occurred upstream from the incident. We had a case where a contractor, shortly before the incident, the contractor had been performing resurfacing on the roadway, which would have raised the elevation. What was called into question is whether that contractor had placed a, a corresponding amount of aggregate to raise the shoulder elevation to be flush with the pavement. Now clients will sometimes ask us, how much of a drop off creates a hazard? Astro recommends that agencies keep drop offs to less than two inches. The US DOT has stated that anything greater than three inches is unsafe. Agencies policies are going to differ and we'll look at the spe specifications applicable to your case. All types of vehicles are impacted. However, bicycles due to the lower speed may be able to come to a controlled stop, dismount and reset. Now there's a couple design and construction options available. The FHWA safety edge creates a beveled surface from the roadway or agencies may find that paving a two to three foot shoulder beyond the edge line um, allows a stable surface in which motorists can safely return to the roadway. When I was a maintenance engineer, I required our maintenance managers to inspect their roadways on a frequent basis. One of the items on their checklist was checking for pavement drop-offs. If those were occurring, they scheduled maintenance activities to uh, reshape the shoulder or add additional aggregate. Most of the defects I'm talking about today that occur at isolated locations. I'm gonna read the statement in the lower right. By violating driver expectancy, a road that is differentially rough may be less safe than a uniformly rough road. A reasonable driver is going to recognize a rough road and adjust their speed and driving behavior accordingly. What we have found is that the transition from a smooth surface to a rough one is what gives the operator great, greater difficulty in controlling their vehicle. Now shoving takes place um, at hills and intersections due to the braking and acceleration action of vehicles. Typical location may be a highway exit ramp. You have a smooth highway surface, operator exits the roadway, to locations where cars and trucks have been braking, that operator is suddenly faced with an abruptly faced with a washboard surface. This can cause loss of control issues, especially for small cars and motorcycles. We would look to see whether the agency had took, taken appropriate steps, such as milling off the high spots or filling in the low spots to repair these locations. And if they hadn't gotten around to that, whether they appropriately warned of the hazard. Now you'll find highway engineers that talk about all types of cracking. The two that we most often see are edge cracking or cracking between the joints between travel lanes. Now I have a case that's very similar to the photograph in the upper right. I'm one of those individuals that ride on those narrow high pressure bicycle tires. That's about a one inch crack. The case that I was involved in, cyclist was riding along where he was trained to ride as far to the right as practicable and struck one of those edge cracks. The front wheel came to an abrupt stop. Regrettably, the cyclist continued moving forward. You know, that's, those edge cracks develop in the very location where cyclists are trained to ride. Now with respect to joint cracks, these are longitudinal cracks between adjacent sections of asphalt or concrete. Without proper treatment, cracks tend to grow. Water infiltrates, throw in a freeze-thaw cycle or two, and additional pavement material breaks off and then pops out. That takes place over a period of time and the pavement surface continues to degrade. Joint cracks may develop to the width of a motorcycle tire. Imagine you're a motorcyclist and you're changing lanes. 
tire drops into the crack, immediately the stability of your vehicle is going to be impacted. Our investigations would look into agency records. Were they aware of the cracks that were developing? Did they take reasonable steps to seal them or have a program in place to remove and replace some of the joints or the areas where these were developing? Isolated runoff the road incidents at curves could be caused by a number of issues, including the loss of surface friction. Now the very last place that you want to lose surface friction is in a curve, but that's exactly where it seems to take place. Um, due to heavy traffic loads, high frequency of speed changing and cornering maneuvers, over time that aggregate becomes polished. Now to get an idea of what this looks like, uh, think, of, think of the pavement surface as a piece of sandpaper. And the tires is that block of wood that you're rubbing across that sandpaper. Over time, sand, the sand particles will wear away, leaving a smooth piece of paper. Now in the case of highway pavement, friction is going to be further reduced when the pavement becomes wet. Now the photograph is a route I travel frequently. Just in the upper left, there's a, a sharp curve. Early on, I was witnessing the early indicators of runoff the road incidents. Uh, started out with tire ruts that were in the turf. Uh, sign and guardrail strikes followed. Uh, if there had been trees or utility poles located within the highway clear zone, they certainly would have been next. Now recently, the agency performed grinding of the pavement surface. This was an effort to improve the coefficient of friction. The, the darker shades of gray are where the, the grinding took place. Uh, the lighter shades of gray are the original pavement surface. No other options are available. Surface treatments such as chip sealing, sand sealing, or slurry seal may also help to improve friction conditions. Now there are a number of preventive steps that can lessen the likelihood of these pavement defects and hazards developing. Starting in the design stage, uh, just the decision between choosing asphalt or concrete uh, should be uh, made with an awareness of the issues that may develop at a particular location. In my experience, we had a, an interchange that was, had several truck stop locations. And what we were observing was the, uh, the shoving and the uh, wheel rutting was taking place in the asphalt pave pavement in those ramps. Um, so what uh, we ended up taking out the, the asphalt layer and replacing that with concrete, which is better able to handle those turning movements and braking that takes place. Agencies should be performing regular and systematic inspections. Um, now, often annual inspections are conducted, and this is done with an eye to evaluating the surface life of the pavement over time, or it's done to create a capital improvement program. Annual inspections, however, may be too infrequent to, to um, detect some of the isolated distresses that um, we see, or the indicators of pending distresses. Um, you know, these, the, the, talk, the distresses I've talked about today or the defects, these don't develop overnight. Um, you know, cracks grow over time, wheel ruts grow over time, um, even potholes. It might seem that that pothole just came up overnight, but if you and I go out to a roadway, we allow a rain shower to pass, pavement for the most part will dry out. But there may be a few areas that remain wet, and as we look closely, those wet areas or those moist areas are near cracks. If you show me those locations, I'll show you your next pothole. So annual inspections may not pick up 
or may not be frequent enough to pick up on the, uh, the defects that we've been talking about. Now, roadway staff needs to be trained, not only for inspecting for the defects, but those early indicators. Um, another set of eyes and ears in the field are law enforcement officers. With some training and good communication between those two teams, uh, they can timely contact each other and those repairs can be made. Agencies should have a, a regular program of preventive maintenance, uh, which may consist of surface treatments or resurfacing. Lastly, if timely repairs cannot be made, warning signs are available for use. Warning signs call attention and alert and warn users to, to uh, conditions that may not be readily apparent. Now I've, I've listed some of the warning signs and shown diagrams of those. All of these are contained within the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices and approved for use. You've likely seen these in your travels. Uh, one particular, it's a plaque, uh, is a motorcycle plaque. That can be used if the warning is primarily directed to motorcyclists. Now when these pavement defects need to be corrected, repair actions, if performed improperly, may result in additional hazards being developed. For this next discussion, I'm gonna turn my screen over to my colleague, Kevin Gorman. Great, thank you, Thomas. Thanks again, Thomas. Thank you, Jesse, and thanks everybody for, for attending today. My name is Kevin Gorman, and I'm a civil and highway construction expert, as well as the Highway Construction Practice Group lead for Robson Forensic. I have over 17 years of DOT, heavy highway construction and highway construction management experience, as well as 10 years of law enforcement experience where I did accident reconstruction as well as criminal investigations. I'm a licensed professional engineer in 15 states as well as the District of Columbia and a certified construction manager issued through the CMAA. Typical cases that we are involved with include crashes in highway construction zones, evaluation of the temporary traffic control in those work zones, evaluation of any hazards that may be present that motorists are exposed to, a review of the actions of the parties on that project as compared to the applicable standards and standards of care, and a determination if any of those actions violated those standards, and if those violations were causative or a direct cause of any of the incidents we're investigating. I performed investigations for clients that representing both plaintiffs and defendants, and in both personal injury and non-personal injury cases. As Thomas mentioned, as roadways age, some of the maintenance um, activities might not be able to keep up with the deterioration of the roadway, and that leads to construction projects, roadway rehabilitation projects, which is gonna be the focus of my discussion here today. In an attempt to minimize impacts to the traveling public and keep roadways open for them as much as possible, we use phased construction, which is a process of performing construction, maybe a lane at a time across a highway and, and not closing or affecting the entire roadway at, at one time. But this inherently can create temporary hazards that motorists then are exposed to when the roadway is opened up at the end of a workday that may or may not have been fully completed or final paving uh, complete, uh, done. Even though these are hazardous, hazardous, they can be reasonable. And to be reasonable, they need to have proper and prior warnings appropriate guarding when required, and they need to comply with the applicable standards um, that are in place for that contract. Lacking any one of those above then can create an unreasonably dangerous condition, which then can be a cause of an incident. I've selected four hazards today that uh, may be created during roadway construction to discuss, and these hazards are four of the more common ones that we see in many of our cases. These are hazards that motorists can be exposed to, therefore making compliance with the applicable standards an important element in ensuring that they are reasonably safe as motorists pass through the worksite. These include uneven lanes, bumps, bumps associated with steel plating for utility type work, grooved pavement, which is created during a milling process, 
and a loose gravel condition, which is uh, the end result of some of these more economical uh, roadway rehabilitation projects. Height differentials. Why are they hazardous? These are one of the most prevalent hazards that are tied to the cases that we see. And they can occur between a travel way and a paved shoulder. They can occur between a travel way and an unpaved area off the side of the road and also between adjacent lanes. These conditions are created by several construction activities, including partial width milling. Milling is the removing of a layer or a depth of existing roadway pavement. So you end up with a roadway surface that's lower than its adjacent lanes. Pavement overlays are just the opposite. You're adding a layer of asphalt or concrete, for example, and raising the level of that new roadway relative to the adjacent ones. And roadway widening. Roadway widening could increase the width of a roadway into an area that is not yet prepared or have shoulder backup brought up to the appropriate height, resulting in an edge drop off condition. Now that is slightly different than the condition that Thomas spoke about with a maintenance perspective because his edge drop offs can develop over time. Construction drop offs are created basically at the end of the day if that roadway is then opened up to traffic. Encountering a drop off is a hazard. One of the reasons this is a hazard is because motorists may be permitted to cross them. We're opening lanes of traffic prior to fully completing them and motorists are allowed to use these surfaces and drive across these lanes at times. But encountering a drop off can lead to a loss of control of a vehicle for many reasons. An inexperienced driver may not anticipate the magnitude of, of effort or the magnitude of disruption of their driving that they'll feel going over an edge. And they may overcompensate and then lead to a skidding or sliding condition where they cannot uh, regain control of their vehicle. Tire scrubbing is an effect that a motorist will feel and the type of edge, how it was recreated, and the depth of that edge will affect how severe that tire scrubbing may be. Vehicle speeds, as we're opening highways under these conditions, the higher and higher speeds, that also becomes a factor which may lead to more uh, loss of control. These drop-off conditions are difficult to see, especially at night in the dark with limited roadway lighting. The color of the pavement on both sides of a, a height differential may be very similar. If a motorist realizes a height differential, they may not realize the magnitude of that differential and therefore not anticipate or properly anticipate what they're gonna feel or what they need to do to, to safely traverse it. Thomas mentioned that motorcycles are more susceptible to some of these hazards. And in this case, I agree fully. Uh, an example case that we worked in Maryland, uh, the signing from their standards are shown to the right there and they highlight a motorcycle and try to get a motorcyclist's attention to further warn them of the condition. They even restrict, restrict on projects, motorcycles changing lanes with an uneven uh, height differential, whereas vehicles may be permitted or may be able to more easily go back and forth over that edge. Ultimately, the unintended or the, uh, the result of a loss of control is the unintended impact with a fixed object, either off the road or with adjacent traffic or oncoming traffic. Some of the common case issues that we deal with regarding drop-offs are the contractor's failure to know or understand his final height differential that's created at the end of the day before he opens that up to traffic. His failure to use proper temporary traffic control. This provides your warning and notice to motorists of the hazardous condition. His failure to apply an appropriate edge treatment. An edge treatment, as you'll see, is the, either the application of additional material to create a nice smooth taper um, versus a vertical drop off or it could include the milling off of additional material to mill in a tapered edge versus having that 90 degree vertical height differential. And finally, if the above three things don't create a safe condition for motorists, then we see contractors failing to guard against this condition by closing the lane or providing appropriate channels, channelizing devices to keep motorists away from this condition. We know vertical drop-offs cause a substantial number of severe crashes each year. As Thomas mentions, AASHTO suggests that a drop-off no greater than six inches should, or I'm sorry, two inches should be used between lanes. 
However, we see that DOT standards vary across the country and how they require height differentials to be addressed. You may see different requirements depending on how that vertical edge was created. Uh, for example, a case in Texas that we worked in the standard shown there on this slide shows that they will allow a maximum of an inch and a quarter height differential on a vertical edge created by milling or planing process, but they will allow up to a two inch vertical differential for a pavement overlay. And the difference there is the severity of that edge. A milled edge is a very sharp edge that can lead to a significant amount of tire scrubbing as well as tire blowouts and is more difficult for a vehicle to overcome. As the asphalt overlay edge is a little softer and a little easier for vehicles to traverse, even up to the two inches that, uh, that Astro recommends, and in this case, Texas DOT recommends. Our analysis for your case would include evaluation of the evidence in the case and the conditions at the time of the incident, and compare those conditions to the standards of care for drop-offs. What was the maximum allowable height that a contractor could have to open the roadway to traffic? What was the required edge treatment? Was that properly put in? How was the edge created and it, did that comply with the applicable standards? What you'll see to, uh, with tra temporary traffic control for this hazard is your uneven lane signs. And these should be placed appropriately in advance of the condition, as well as repeated throughout the, uh, the work site as long as this condition exists. Typically we see a minimum spacing of every mile for these signs but that needs to be evaluated and, and a field engineering uh, judgment needs to be made as, as what's reasonable and uh, will create a safer environment for the passing motorists. And finally, if the condition isn't safe to open traffic, you'll see lane closures. And these again also need to be appropriately warned with proper temporary traffic control. So ultimately, if too high of a differential is left in place, there's an improper taper, or you have an in inadequate temporary traffic control, this could become an unreasonably dangerous condition. There are cases, however, though, there are drop-offs that were in, in effect, and these drop-offs were in compliance with the applicable standards and may not have been able to be tied to causation. The next hazard are bumps, and these differ from drop-offs in that drop-offs run longitudinally with traffic. Bumps are typically transverse or perpendicular to the direction of travel. These are created at the beginning and end of milled or overlaid sections. You're either dropping into a milled section and then popping out of it or vice versa for an overlay. Roadway plates have bumps if they're placed on top of a roadway, onto the plate and off of the plate. Transitions from main lines onto temporary roads for bypasses or runarounds, they can occur, they can have bumps if not properly um, tapered into the existing roadway. And as you see in the picture to the right, many urban areas or streets that uh, where you're milling or overlaying, the utilities, the height of the utilities don't change. So you're left with a manhole lid that's two and a half inches above the existing surface, utility boxes, even inlets on the side of the road, could end up being vertical edges that would create a bump and need to be addressed properly. Bumps are hazards because they could be an unexpected transition, uh, could lead to a loss of control. Um, for steel plates, there could be a reduction in friction, especially when wet, if the steel plate isn't properly addressed. And this would be both for pedestrians and motorists. Loss of vehicle control is the end result of some of these conditions, and a slip and fall could be the result of a slippery plate placed in a pedestrian crosswalk. Common case issues that we see for this type of uh, hazard includes the fare to use proper tapers similar type taper to a uh, drop off, but these again are gonna be uh, perpendicular to the direction of traffic. Most of the times they're too short. The contractor doesn't wanna spend the time or the place the material to have a proper taper to address the height of the edge of the bump that he's addressing. Inadequate temporary traffic control. S signs in advance of the condition and during the condition. Not adding texture or slip resistance to these plates leads to motorcycle crashes, pedestrian slip and falls. And these plates also by spec are typically required to be secured to the roadway to avoid them moving and creating tripping hazards or, or other hazards associated with these plates moving off the intended area they were covering. We will analyze a case and the factors in a case against the standards for bumps and they include what's the required taper and what's the required uh, uh, 
speed that that tape would be appropriate to. Similar to drop-offs, different states address these transverse temporary transverse joints differently. In the case in New York, we were working um, and the standard shown there to the right, a portion of it, they actually differentiate how long it's in place. Seven days or less is different than in longer than a week. And then they further differentiate what they want depending on the speed of the roadways. And you'll see a, a longer taper as the speed um, of the roadway that this tapers on increases. And for example, New Jersey and Illinois have shown that they, they have a set taper length, regardless of how long it's in place or what the speed of the roadways are. And you'll see variance across the DOTs. We'll also look at the details of the steel plate placements. Was the place in plate, or was the plate in place, did it meet these standards? Was there texture on the steel plate or was there the required additional maybe marking highlighting the edges of this plate? The traffic control that you'll see typically for this hazard includes bump signs placed again appropriately ahead of time to give motorists advance warning. You'll see steel plate ahead signs. And there should be warnings for pedestrians if pedestrian travel could be anticipated or foreseen to be in the area of where this steel plate may be. And then is the proper taper for the speed and duration on which that condition is going to exist. First two hazards that uh, I discussed involve basically elevation changes. The last two are going to involve surface conditions created during construction projects. Loose gravel or a chip sealed road, you all may be familiar with it when you're driving along and all of a sudden you hear all this rocks and pebbles hitting up in your wheel wells and, and just making a whole lot of noise. Most likely you're on a recently tar and chip roadway. A chip seal is just one of several economical roadway rehabilitation treatments that can be used and it involves placing layers of asphalt with one or more layers of aggregate on top of it. And this loose aggregate is the cause of the hazard, um, if, but if done properly, can be done reasonably. The hazards with a tar and chip type roadway, uh, the reduction in roadway friction. And this could be caused twofold. This could be caused by loose gravel, um, kind of like marbles on a road, or if there's excess asphalt applied, it can actually bleed up through the surface and create a slippery condition due to asphalt um, bleeding and, and a layer of, um, of asphalt on the surface of the roadway. As Thomas mentioned, um, curves in the roadway are, are, are notorious for vehicles leaving the roadway on a newly tar and chip roadway, uh, road where the friction is most needed to negotiate that curve. The motorcycles go down on a tangential path and slide off the back side of the road and hit whatever fixed object may be there, whether it's guide rail or a tree. Motorcyclists and bicyclists with their two wheels are most susceptible to this loss of control. Flying rocks are also a hazard. Um, we worked a case in Pennsylvania where a flying rocks caused a vehicle to change lanes, resulting in uh, an incident there. Unexpected damage or unexpected reactions to motorists to getting hit with these rocks is, is one of the hazards. And lastly, no pavement markings. This process covers up and eliminates existing pavement markings. So therefore motorists may have a condition where they don't know where the center line is or don't know where the edge line is. Cases, uh, common case issues for this type of uh, hazard. Again, as you'll see consistently throughout these is there's not, or there's insufficient temporary traffic control. This not only needs to be in place during construction, it needs to be in place for the duration of that roadway being open to the public until the road itself had a, had a chance to cure and excess gravel get worn away, et cetera. Improper material usage. These products and these systems are designed to maximize adhesion between the asphalt and the loose aggregate. If they don't use the proper material or don't use quality materials, you could limit the amount of adhesion, adhesion between the two, which result in additional or excess gravel that will result in redu reduced friction as discussed. Improper application rates, again, with that higher asphalt or higher aggregate applications, you're gonna end up with a slippery condition. Not sweeping the roadway to remove loose aggregate after the emulsion sets, just opening it up to traffic and is a common case issue. And lastly, not providing warning or providing substitute temporary pavement markings is another issue.
The standard of care against, we would, against which we would evaluate the factors of your case include what materials were used? Did they meet the specifications and application rates? Was there calibration of the material and equipment uh, prior to beginning work? Was the roadway swept? Were the specifications met as far as care of the roadway before opening the traffic? And was it open too early? Um, proper cure time could result in proper amount of adhesion of material to the asphalt, but opening it too early doesn't give it a chance to fully set. Typical traffic control that you'll see for these, this case would be either loose gravel signs or many, many municipalities use a sign like you see on your left, fresh oil and chip or fresh tar and chip. Those are all indicators that you basically have loose aggregate uh, up ahead. I know as a motorcyclist, I would hate seeing these signs and would do everything I could to avoid going over these roadways. And no, temp no center line or no pavement marking signs, which are MUTCD approved signs, should be placed if you're not replacing the markings themselves. The last hazard I'm going to discuss is milling. Milling is a process by which a machine with a big grinding wheel grinds off a seven to eight foot width of pavement, uh, shoots it into a conveyor belt or uses a conveyor belt to shoot into a dump truck and haul it off the project. The effect on the roadway this has, it leaves a groove surface. Those teeth in the milling head um, create a groove texture pattern that uh, you may be able to pick out in the photo to your right there. Now these grooves may or may not be parallel with the direction of travel. They may wander across a lane. Some loose material can be left behind. That conveyor belt in the, in the process does not get 100% of the loose material that's ground off. This process typically will create a vertical edge uh, until you're completely milled across the, the roadway that you're working on. And that vertical edge is a, is a hazard as we discussed and would also need to be treated appropriately. And lastly, as you mill down a, a layer of um, asphalt off the roadway or, or top wearing course, you can reveal or expose underlying failures. And these failures can ultimately re re uh, result in potholes or, or bigger depressions, kind of like Thomas discussed, that, that are the same type of hazard. You can have a reduced friction hazard with milling. If too much loose material is left behind, um, you'd end up with the same scenario that you had with a, uh, um, a chip seal process. The grooves do have a profound effect on motorcycle handling, especially if they wander across a lane or you have an inexperienced motorcyclist um, not able to compensate or not able to um, negotiate that, that effect of the mill, milled surface on it. Flying debris is a hazard, as well as the potholes and this process as well eliminates pavement markings that can be a hazard. Common case issues that we see are not sweeping or, or vacuuming up loose debris. Improper temporary traffic control. Again, these processes may go on for miles and that warning needs to provide, be provided at intervals as long as that hazard exists because motorists lose attention. Um, they need to be keep, uh, need to keep be reminded that um, that this hazard is there underneath their wheels. Missing temporary roadway markings and not properly replacing them. And another little lesser known um, specification is that these milled surfaces typically are specified to be overlaid in a certain amount of time. The longer this milled surface is left exposed to traffic, the further it could uh, unravel and break apart and, and continue to create uh, a worsening condition for, for a roadway structure. A milled surface is a typical milled surface that is open to the public in this phase construction, and it can be done reasonably safe if the standards are followed. Milled roadways many times, as discussed, will create that drop-off condition, so you're almost dealing with two scenarios, two hazards at the same time. Standards of care against which we evaluate case factors include maximum depth of milling, what was called for in the plans, what was required. How long can that milled surface stay open to traffic? And what's the required cleanup? And was that properly done or adequately done? And the temporary, typical temporary traffic control you'll see are groove pavement signs. And they should be appropriately placed. You may see highlighted uh, warnings for motorcycles, as Thomas discussed, and as you see there to your left. And the addition of temporary roadway markings at the end of the day prior to opening the traffic. 
So the typical questions addressed on our cases involve around, was adequate temporary traffic control in place? Was it at the proper locations and did it adequately warn or guard the public and provide reasonable safe passage through the work zone? Was the roadway even appropriately open to traffic? Should it have been closed and guarded as discussed earlier? Was the work being completed in accordance with the specifications and standards of care? Was the temporary traffic control set up reasonable for the work being completed? Did they have four out of five lanes of an interstate closed and really only needed one lane closed? That'd be the reasonableness that we would be looking at. Was proper oversight or inspection work being performed by the owner or owner's represent representatives? And lastly, were any noted violations of the standards, were they causative or were they a direct cause of the incident? Those are all questions we look to answer on your cases as the facts allow us to. So I would say the takeaway for this is that roadway construction may result in the creation of temporary roadway defects. The defects by their nature are hazardous to motors, but they can be reasonably constructed. Contractors and owners through their oversight, they need to address these hazards. They need to have proper traffic control in place and they need to meet the applicable standards and standards of care for the operation that they're doing that created this hazard. And ultimately the failure to do so can create an unreasonably dangerous condition, which may be a direct cause of an incident. So with that, I think I'll kick it back to Jesse. Thank you, Kevin. Really appreciate the time you spent not only being here today, but but also preparing. Please keep your, your uh, camera on and your microphone on as well. We had a, a number of questions that came in throughout the program. And Thomas, thank you for turning your camera back on as well. The first question that we had come in, I think is particularly relevant right now, especially with some of the travel restrictions in place, but, but really always because um, uh, this attendee uh, asked the, the question of, since it can take a while to retain an expert and get an expert out to document the scene, is there any advice for counsel on, on what they can do to memorialize the, the shapes and measurements of, of any roadway defects that may have been involved in their cases? And, and what, what advice would you give to them? Um, I'll handle this first, I guess. Um, a lot of times documentation and docu um, measurements and photos are taken at the time of the incident or available through the various parties. Um, through discovery process, many times we get most of the information that we need through inspectors, DOT inspectors, contractors, uh, ex uh, police reports, et cetera. Um, ultimately, if it becomes critical, because those conditions don't always last. So sometimes we have to do the best best we could do with the information we have. And it is not always possible to preserve these, such as lane differentials, contractors paving the lane the next day. And, um, but there are cases that, that it could be expedited to get somebody out there and at least take the important measurements, or we could be consulted on the phone to direct, hey, get these couple measurements if you have somebody close or get these pictures. I think that would be a way to, to preserve it as, as best as you can with, with time of the essence. Yeah, and I, I think that's all good advice. Um, although I think we can, maybe we can go further, right? So if, if counsel's out there and, and they're doing their own preliminary investigation and taking their own photos, um, we'd probably want to see them include uh, tape measures in their photos, right? C capture a, a, a picture of the entire scene before, before zooming in too close to the, to the pothole where it's difficult to, um, to understand the scale of, of what it is we're looking at or, or perhaps the location. Um, are, are there specific tools, either Kevin or Thomas, that, that you use as part of your analysis that might be handy for the, for the attorneys to think, oh gosh, it's, it's a roadway case. Maybe, maybe, I need, maybe I need these things in my, in my toolbox before I, I go out to the scene. It's, and and I, can, um, I can add in to what Kevin had mentioned. Um, photographs are, are very helpful. And, and especially including that tape measure in the, in the photograph, as well as recording the uh, measurement itself. Jesse had mentioned taking a, a big picture view. Um, those are especially helpful to um, take into the entire context of, of what is taking place 
before narrowing down to those specific images. Um, I found even if you just have a, um, a, a, a pencil with you, you know, that, that helps to put the, um, the pavement drop off in, in relative terms that would be understandable to um, other individuals. Yeah, absolutely. I know um, we had a webinar earlier this year, and, and for anybody who's, who's curious to, to learn more about this topic, um, if you go to our archive of webinars, we have one on photogrammetry and taking effective site inspection photos. And through that webinar, if you, if you stream it and, and follow through, we have one of our architects who gives advice about um, documenting the entire scene and then specific aspects within that scene and the potential of incorporating standardized items like a, a can of Pepsi, uh, which is, I don't know, six inches, a dollar bill, a quarter. These are established um, standard sized items from which uh, further calculations could be derived uh, at a later time or, or at least substantiated if you wanted to, um, to to verify any calculations that you made on the scene. So, so, so keep in mind if you have any questions on, on where to see that, um, you can send us an email, inquiries at robsonforensic.com, and, and we'll, get, uh, we'll get a link out to you so you can check that one out. Um, another question that came in kind of related to that, right, because um, these roadway defects, to Thomas's point and, and to Kevin's, they, they don't last forever. They, they, don't, they don't develop overnight, but then they, they, don't, they don't stick around because oftentimes municipalities will address these. So if, if notice is an issue in the case and, and part of your analysis is to try to um, estimate or determine when this roadway defect would have become apparent to the municipality, what are some of the, the approaches that you take in your cases to try, to try to figure out when did this condition start? Jesse, I can, I can feel that one. Yep. Um, Certainly a tool that has become available recently is Google Street View Images. So that's an, a ready uh, resource available to us. Um, but many agencies maintain their own version of Street View uh, photo logs that they take on a annual basis or biannually, um, which records the images of a van driving down the roadway. So we essentially get um, the same image that you might get um, through Street View. Mm -hmm. And then also, um, more and more agencies are moving away from the paper and pencil uh, recording of pavement conditions and monitoring and moving towards uh, vans, digital vans that will, can record the deficiencies and at the same time take uh, digital images as the vehicle moves down the road. Um, so they use, those um, may be available um, through public records and um, allow us to, you know, not only in this case, establish pavement conditions, but what other roadway elements that were available at that particular location or in the history of that location. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, so uh, one last question, because we are running out of time. And, and Kevin, in your session, you had referenced steel plates on a couple of the on a couple of your slides. Uh, we had an attendee who asked, um, "What what are those those treatments for the steel plates in order to increase that coefficient coefficient of friction, uh, whether that's in a, a crosswalk or or travel lane?" Sure, and and it could depend depend on whether it's expected or foreseen that pedestrians would use it, but typically there's a, a friction surface that can be applied to the plates before they're delivered to the project, almost like um, painting, with a, a painting with paint and having sand sprinkled on it to create a friction surface that, that is suitable for pedestrians and, and motorists even when wet. And kind of tied with this, just to wrap around back to that first question, many of the defects that I talked about have to do with the height and the height is going to be the critical number that will be used to evaluate whether they met the standards of care or not. Mm -hmm. So that would be the one measurement that would be a key measurement to take right on the spot if somebody's out there the day of um, to, to try to gain that measurement, whether it's a steel plate or whether it's an edge drop off or a bump. But um, so that would, that would be the one quick thing to preserve as much as you can and a key piece of the, 
the, uh, the puzzle. Got it. Great advice. Um, we did just have um, another question come in from Linda and I'm not, this one might be too case specific to really get into. Um, so, so Linda, maybe we can follow up with you after the webinar, but, uh, but she's asking about a case in which there are uh, two lanes that were milled. One side gets ACFC, which as the marketing guy, I don't know what that means. Um, and the other one did not, and it, it was rainy weather paving. Um, and there's a question about whether or not the, the lanes were safe to reopen. Is it, do you have insight that's worth sharing or is this one that, that would be better to take offline? Yeah, I'm assuming or guessing that it has to do with an application of maybe the, um, the tack coat um, that's applied prior to an overlay, prior um, to get that overlay to stick. There are standards as far as how far out and in front of the paving that should be placed. And with the idea of covering it up with paving at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So depending on the, the specifics, it, that, that could be an issue that it was maybe paved out too far and you, you got a roadway covered with AC20 that, that got wet, so. Got it. So yeah, Linda, if you're, if you're receptive to it, we'll, we'll get you a message after, after the end of the webinar to, to see if you want to set up a time to talk with one of our experts to, to see if, if we're in a position to help you out. And, and that offer really goes out to everyone else who is on this call. If, if you're working on a case and you'd like to, you know, bend the ear of one of our experts, uh, send us a message. Um, usually the best way to do it is, is that email box inquiries at robsonforensic.com or if you have a local business development person who you work with, get us a copy of the complaint. We'll run a conflict just to make sure that, that we don't have any issues with, um, with getting involved or, or talking to you about the case. And oftentimes we can have a short discussion uh, with you, uh, with our experts to, um, to determine, uh, you know, how and if we can, we can assist on your case. I hope that, that today has been uh, informative, insightful, helpful for everybody who's, who's here. I hope that you'll, you'll join us again for future weeks. Um, Kevin, Thomas, especially, I really appreciate the time that, that you spent preparing and being with us here today. Um, that brings us to the end of our time. Uh, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you.